Hello and welcome. We continue with Spring Camp Meeting 2011. We have a wonderful audience here. We have many from different parts of the United States. Is anyone here from uh, outside the United States? Anybody? Yes, we have a couple here. Another over there. Very good. Praise the Lord. How many are from Southern Illinois? Raise your hand. Oh, a few of you. <laughs> How many are outside of Southern Illinois? The majority of you. Welcome, every one of you. We know that you'll be blessed because we've been praying for God's blessing. And the speakers have been praying. The singers have been preparing. And we know that God has a blessing in store for us. So we hope that you will prepare yourself to be blessed. Uh, during this uh, program, we are going to have a wonderful message in song by Sister Tammy Chance. I will tell you about that in a moment. But first, let me tell you about our speaker for this hour. It is Pastor Jay Rosario. That's the way you say it in Spanish, Rosario. In, Sp in English, it's Rosario. But uh, he is a pastor now in Central California, and he will be bringing a message to us on revival. Actually, the title of his message is Helping Churches, Helping Churches Experience Revival. Helping Churches Experience Revival. This is part one. That means there's a at least a part two. Very good. You're, you're, you're well uh, aware of what's going on. So this is part one. We hope you will jot down some notes. And also, not only that it will be just notes and something you say amen to today, but that you will put into practice these principles that you will hear so that there can be revival, not only in the churches, but for us as individuals. Amen? Uh, the... Music you are about to hear is by Sister Tammy Chance, who has a wonderful, uh, sweet spirit about her. And you will see that in the music. Uh, she will be singing, He Will Carry You. Before she sings, I would like to uh, ask you to uh, stand for prayer. Stand for prayer, and then after prayer, Sister Tammy Chance will lead us in song. And the next voice you will hear after uh, this beautiful message and song will be the voice of Pastor Jay Rosario. Let us pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we ask, Lord, for a blessing from heaven. We pray, Lord, that as we hear this music that will elevate our hearts to your throne of grace. You will lead us, Lord, into holy communion with you. And also, Lord, as we hear the message you have for us through your servant, Pastor Rosario, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon him. Use him mightily, Lord, to speak to your children. And we pray that your children here will be blessed and your children wherever they are in the world. We ask for these things in Jesus' holy and blessed name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. There is no problem too big. God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall. He cannot move. And there is no storm too dark, God cannot calm it. There is no sorrow too deep, He cannot soothe it.
problem too big God cannot solve it There is no mountain too tall He cannot move it And there is no storm too dark God cannot calm it There is no sorrow too deep He cannot soothe it If he carried the weight of the world Upon his shoulders ooh, I know my brother that he will carry you If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders ooh, I know my sister that he He will carry you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for that beautiful music. Wasn't that beautiful? Yeah. Have you been enjoying yourselves? What an exciting time to spend um, together uh, with people from different parts of the country and different par parts of the world to uh, talk about the most important person in the world. Amen? Amen? And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a privilege to be with you all. I bring you greetings from uh, sunny and beautiful California. Uh, it's good to be in the Midwest. And uh, I see that you've been somewhat uh, generous sharing a little bit of your weather challenges even all the way to the west. I just heard last week that we had a, a there was a, a tornado thingy, an alert in Northern California. Kind of a crazy world we're living in today, right? We know that it's only going to get more uh, extraordinary. As long as we're on the same boat with Jesus, it's all good. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm humbled uh, to be rubbing shoulders with such amazing presenters and such an amazing audience. Um, we have an exciting presentation this morning entitled, Helping Churches Experience Revival. And I believe this is a relevant subject uh, to all of us, and I think it kind of goes um, in harmony with the mission of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, we know that that's one of the initiatives for the global church, and that is revival and reformation uh, here and now. So I'm really excited about the message, and I trust and pray that it will be a blessing to you all. Uh, let's have a prayer just to make sure that the, the right speaker is here this morning. Amen? Amen? And not Jay Rosario, but the Holy Spirit. Just bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we rejoice that uh, you see beauty in us when at times we don't and when others don't. And uh, we come before you right now humbled. Um, and at the same time, Father, we're, we're very excited at uh, the potential that you give to each and every one of us. We want to pray in a special way that uh, you may hide me behind the cross. We would see Jesus. Uh, we do not want to hear the philosophies or the uh, perspective of, of mortal man. We want to hear from infinite God. So please, Lord, we ask that you may tabernacle with us in this moment, that we may abide under the shadow of the Almighty, that we may feel you close, and that we may be in close proximity to your kingdom. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revival. When you think of revival, what comes, what's the first kind of images that come to your mind? When you think of revival? The Holy Spirit. Okay, anything else? Awake. Anything else? Change. Okay. Anything else? Renewal. Okay, jumping up and getting excited is what one of our attendees says. And you're totally welcome to do this 
if you feel the spirit moving. <laughs> Just be mindful of those around you. <laughs> so walking in the light. So when we think of revival, there's so many different pictures that come into our mind. One of the pictures that I get into my mind is somebody who is in their deathbed and who's at the brink of dying and then, you know what this is, right? Revival takes place, yeah? So the word revival communicates a, a back to life, yeah? In fact, the word re implies that there's a repetition. And vival is uh, in Spanish uh, viva, right? We have this word called viva, which basically uh, is associated with the word life. So the word revival is really the coming back to life. And some churches can use a little coming back to life. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Actually, if, if I'm bold enough, and I hope I don't get stoned, but some churches um, really don't need revival. They just need vival. <laughs> right? Because revival is that you've been alive, you've died. Reviving, you need to come back to life again. But some churches have never been alive. They just need to live. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about revival. We're going to talk a little bit about what is revival. We're going to talk about why do we need revival. And we're going to talk about what you can do as a layperson in your church to bring a little revival into your congregation. Amen? Amen. And I hope you're encouraged. I remember a story, a very interesting story. I'm not sure if this is true or not. I hope it's true because if it is, it's, it'd be really good, especially in this message. Um, story is told about uh, an atheist man. And I have a lot of good friends that are atheists, and uh, this particular atheist man was approached by many, many people in the, on the from the church down the street. You have to understand, this town, this community was very small, and uh, everybody knew that he was an atheist. You know, the town has to be very small if everybody knows that you're an atheist. So everybody came and knocked on the door. Everybody dropped off literature. Everybody invited him to church. Everybody invited him to concerts. Everybody invited him to vegetarian cooking classes. You name it. They've done it all. They've tried it all. And everybody just pretty much had written him off as somebody who's absolutely impossible. You need an army to bring conversion to this individual. And one particular situation took place that really uh, kind of invaded the headline news and all the journals and the papers in this little town. That particular church, uh, composed by not so many people, and though there was a lot of activity, it was really a, a church that didn't have a whole lot of, uh, it didn't have a welcoming presence into it. Some of you may understand what I'm talking about. It didn't have kind of this, this uh, friendly aura surrounding it. And although there were a few who were actively involved in this, that, and the other, the collective body of believers were kind of, they were kind of gloomy when they would worship. And that explains the difficulty in growth. Amen. And what would happen is that many times people would invite people to come to church and the few who attended only came once and that was pretty much the last time they attended. And this particular church, something happened that it, it actually caught to flames. Something happened uh, uh, that it started catching on fire. And everybody in town, of course, is a small town, building catches on fire. Everybody's going to know about it. So everybody rushed to see if there was any uh, casualties to see, make sure everybody was doing all right. Of course, the members were the first ones there, then the neighbors, then everybody else. And lo and behold, who else do you think was running towards the church? That atheist. And everybody knew him, even those who weren't church members. And the atheist was sprinting to the church. And I think he was one of the last ones to arrive. And all the church members looked as the atheist was approaching, and they're their jaws were on the floor. They're like, and, and he arrived at the scene. Everybody was staring at him, and he felt kind of uncomfortable. He's like, well, what are you guys staring at me for? And he says, and they, and they all said to him, well, this is amazing. This is, the, this, is the, this is the first time we ever see you running to the church. This is exciting. And then the atheist kind of c catching his breath because he's been running. He says, well, this is the first time ever, I've ever seen the church on fire. Now, now there's, a lot of, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from this story, amen? So here you have an atheist. He's running to the church because finally the church is on fire, right? In the literal sense. Now, don't get any ideas, amen? I'm not suggesting anything. The point is that when the church is on fire, people are going to know, amen? 
when the church is on fire, everybody is going to know that something is happening in that church. They may not know exactly what's happening, but they, they definitely will know that there is something worth going to this church for. The people here are having an amazing experience that is attractive, yeah? That is kinda, it's kinda, it kind of woos people. And ladies and gentlemen, if our churches were really on fire, people would be coming to us. Now, don't get me wrong. I've been heavily involved in evangelism for several years, and I'm all about seeking the lost. But there is several places in scriptures where it talks about the nations coming to us and asking us, who is this God that you are serving? We want in. We want in. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that every single church, and I would go as far to say that every church represented here this morning, has the potential of attracting every single individual in the neighborhood. Amen? Amen. And it's all about what is happening on the inside. I've been uh, involved, like I mentioned before, in evangelistic meetings, etc. And you know, we've, we sent so many thousands of flyers to the community. You guys know what I'm talking about? And there's nothing wrong with that. But I believe that the greatest fire is the members that are coming out of that service. Glowing. Amen? With the glory of Jesus that is wooing others into, into His presence and into the same experience. So you are the greatest flyer. You are the greatest advertisement for the church. It should not be a handbill exclusively. And maybe that's one of the reasons why the Lord can't bring more people into our congregations. And if you're here, and if you're kind of a little bit borderline about to throw in the towel uh, in the case of your church, there's hope even for your church. Amen? Don't give up for your church. We're going to talk a little bit about how is it that God can bring life, spiritual life, to spiritual dead people. And maybe you're kind of wondering to yourself, how in the world is God going to cause fire in my church? I mean, that's going to be impossible. I mean, have you heard my music, our church services before? My goodness. And you kind of fill in the blanks. We all um, represent different challenges in our local congregations. But you may be to the point where you're like, I, it's, it's going to be something very, it has, it's going to have to require something very large and very enormous in order for my church to get back on fire. But I don't believe so, amen? What we're going to discover is that revival is not so much something corporate as something individual, amen? Although it does manifest itself powerfully when individual people who have experienced revival are collectively together. And that's kind of the whole point of why we come together as God's people. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, and we're going to be using the Bible quite a bit. Amen? So we're going to, we're going to do a little finger exercises this morning. <laughs> so I want to encourage you to make sure you have your pen in handy and if you have a notepad to write. We won't get through all the material, but uh, we're going to be delving quite deeply into the Word. Ezekiel chapter 37, I believe, gives us a very symbolic picture of revival. Amen? Ezekiel chapter 37, and when you're there, please say a hearty amen. amen. Wow, that was a hearty amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. Ezekiel chapter 37, and maybe some, some of you who are turning to Ezekiel 37 already know what Ezekiel 37 is a little bit about. Amen. In fact, we have a sister who knows what it's about. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, we're actually going to talk a little bit about the last part of Ezekiel 37. Uh, we're going to be talking about this morning a little bit about the first portion of Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 talks about the dry bones. Right? Let's, take, let's pick up the story in verse 1. Ezekiel 37, verse 1, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of what? Bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very what? Dry. So we know that they were bones and we know that they were dry. Verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And that's the question that I asked you this morning. Can the bones live? Well, let's find out if the bones can live. Can the bones live was the question. So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And some of you are saying the same thing. <laughs> like, Lord, you're the only one who can answer that question. <laughs> Verse 4. And again he said to me, prophesy or proclaim or preach to these bones and say unto them, O oh, dry bones, hear the philosophies of man. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Am I, I, I guess I have a different translation. I'm sorry. Let me try that again. Oh, dry bones, hear really funny jokes. Wow, I guess. What does it say? Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, I proclaimed, I preached as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews in the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, I preached, I proclaimed as he commanded me, and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. You can read the rest of the story later on. So here we have this vivid description of Ezekiel 37, and it kind of looks like a sci-fi movie, doesn't it? I mean, wow, here you have a valley of dry bones. Picture yourself in the Grand Canyon. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon before? Picture yourself in the Grand Canyon and picture that entire canyon full of dry bones. Kind of an eerie atmosphere, no? I remember I was in, uh, in Lima, Peru, in South America several years ago, and I had the pr privilege of going to El Museo de la Inquisición, the Museum of the Inquisition. I'm glad it was only a museum, amen, and not an actual inquisition. As we went through the museum, they took us underneath the ground. It was dark. It smelled very bad, and it was scary. And we approached one particular corner of this long, very tight pathway. And as we got to the corner, guess what I saw? I saw the bones of many of God's children who were unwilling to sacrifice their conscience, amen, for popularity and for position. I saw the bones, many of which I, know, I don't know the names of, of individuals that were willing to die instead of go with the flow. I saw bones. And as I looked at these bones, I realized it gave me a little bit of a picture of what Ezekiel experienced. Now, being surrounded with bones is kind of a, an, you know, an extraordinary, unusual experience. But what was Ezekiel told to do to these bones? To preach to the Valley of Bones. Now, if being in the presence of dead, dry bones is unusual, preaching <laughs> to a group of dead, dry bones would be even more unusual, yeah? I'm sure Ezekiel looked over both his shoulders before he did this, yes? to make sure that nobody was looking. And on top of that, preaching to a group of dead, dry bones who come alive is even more unusual. Amen? Amen? So here you have Ezekiel, and God tells him, Ezekiel, I want you to share a devotional to this valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel's thinking, are you kidding me? But nonetheless, that's exactly what he does. Notice the Bible does not say, God did not tell Ezekiel to take out his musical instruments. Amen? Now, don't get me wrong. If there's anybody in this room that loves music, is yours truly. However, I believe when we approach the subject of revival and we consider it not only in, in, in the Adventist uh, perspective, even in all of Christianity, we immediately associate it to music exclusively. Right? Music has definitely its place in worship. And I love the hymns and I love all the beautiful uh, master uh, hymn writers in the past, the Wesleys and, 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 the, and all, all of the other ones. But... If you notice, Ezekiel takes the valley of dry bones and brings them back to the source, amen, to the energy and to the power. 
Now, I'm not saying that music doesn't have the capabilities of doing this, but in this particular scenario, Ezekiel did not go the musical instrument route. Amen? In many a time and in many a services, you have the music that overwhelms the service and you have a 10-minute uh, devotional. Amen? <laughs> And I believe that here we have kind of a good outline of what we should do if we really want to bring revival into our churches. So here we have the Valley of Dry Bones. Now question, according to this passage, whom do the Valley of Dry Bones represent? The house of Israel. Now who was the house of Israel in the Old Testament? Ah, it was the church. So Ezekiel 37 is giving us a very graphic depiction of the condition of the Old Testament church. And that's a pretty graphic de depiction, would you not say so? And sadly, that depiction, that spiritual x-ray, is very accurate even today in some of our churches. What is the point of Ezekiel 37? Well, there's several points. One of the points is that the church is a problem. Amen? <laughs> the second point is that don't fret. There's a solution to that problem. And that's what I love about the Bible is that that's what I love about God is that He exposes our shortcomings. He exposes our flaws, but He provides a solution. And that's what Ezekiel, Ezekiel is not standing in the valley of dry bones and he's pointing fingers at, the, at all the bones. saying, you're in this situation because you did this. You're in this situation because you did that. It was your fault. Don't blame it on me. I'm the prophet. I told you this. You didn't listen to me. Is that what Ezekiel did? No, no ladies and gentlemen. He simply went back to the fountain of truth. He went back to the wells of salvation and he brought a little bit of that to the valley of dry bones. Now what happened when Ezekiel preached the word to the valley of dry bones? The Bible says that they came to life but they were missing something. They were missing the breath. Now what does the breath represent? It rep we have several occasions in scripture where Remember when Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit, right? So breath is kind of this symbol of the Holy Spirit and it's also a symbol of inspiration. In fact, if you read 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, which is a common text we all know, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, if you read in some older translation, it actually says all scripture is God breathed. <sighs> Isn't that interesting? So God kind of breathed into every page of scripture. So that as you're reading in the morning, in your quiet time with Jesus, you could take in a little bit of that breath. Amen? And by the way, that breath is sweet. Amen? It smells very good. So in Ezekiel chapter 37, you have the breath and you have the word. And when you combine these two things, ladies and gentlemen, be very careful. Because an explosion will happen. Amen? Amen. But this is a good explosion. Okay? This is not like the fire that we talked about in, in, in our introductory story. We need another kind of fire, right? We need another kind of explosion. A chain reaction will take place. The Bible tells us that the bones began to develop tissue. They began to develop a, a nervous system. Uh, the organs started to develop. Skin developed and covered the bones. Eventually, what was the final product of this revival project or revival experience? Israel was standing on their feet, and the Bible says, as an exceedingly great army. Question, when an, when an army is standing, exceed, in, in, an exceeding army is standing on their feet, what does that communicate? What does that imply? It doesn't imply at ease, right? <laughs> Attention. It implies that they are about to do something. They are about to engage in warfare. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what every single congregation represented here should be doing. Amen? Engaging in Christian warfare under the banner, the bloodstained banner of Emmanuel. Even in the churches that we look and we say, how in the world is this church going to come to life? Ladies and gentlemen, we see the divine prescription. We see what the remedy is for spiritual deadness. Maybe you're surrounded every single week with a group of believers and you look around and it feels like you're surrounded by a valley of dead bones. There's good news this morning. Don't give up. Amen. Don't walk out on that church. Amen? Amen? Don't give up because maybe, just maybe, you are that conduit. You're that instrument that God is going to use to create. You're going to be that Ezekiel. Amen? 
God is looking for Ezekiels, ladies and gentlemen. Not Ezekiels that will point the finger and blame people, no, but will just lead people back to the source of life, Amen. the source of power and the source of conviction. So the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 37 that God is interested in bringing His church from spiritual deadness to spiritual revival so that they can be at their post of duty ready to march forward at the command of General Jesus. But it's some, there's something very fascinating if you look at verse 11. It tells us a little bit, it gives us a hint as to how the church actually fell into this condition. Right? You ever wonder, how in the world did the church go from this booming uh, global, uh, international uh, kingdom? You know, we think of the, the time of Solomon, the golden age of Israel. How did it go from there to spiritual deadness? Like what happened, right? Well, if you look at verse 11, it tells us. They indeed say, they being the house of Israel, our bones are dry. Now, what does that mean? Our hope is lost. Our hope is lost. Israel lost the spiritual life but because they lost hope in their spiritual future. And he says, we ourselves are cut off. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very carefully. When we lose hope in the message that God has given us, there's only one place that we're destined to go, and that is a valley of dry bones. Amen. When we lose hope in the children that we have raised, who for whatever reason have been wayward and have fallen away, when we lose hope that God is actually able to reach them and bring them back, ladies and gentlemen, we are in danger of falling into a valley of dry bones. When you lose hope in your marriage, even in churches, we have a situation where the marriage could be dead, yeah? The marriage needs a little revival. If you lose hope in your marriage, that hopelessness is going to bleed into your spiritual life and you're going to become a valley of dry bones. Hopelessness equals valley of dry bones. Israel said we lost our hope kind of makes sense why the Word of God brings revival because the Bible is full of hope. Amen? Amen. The Bible is full of hope. When, you, when Ezekiel uh, preached the Word, I believe he was preaching the promises of God. I believe that. Amen. It doesn't tell us exactly what parts of Scripture he was preaching, but I believe he was reminding Israel in their dead condition that God had a great plan for Israel. God wanted them to become this beautiful group of people that will be a contagious uh, element so that they could permeate the truths of God's Word throughout all of civilization and antiquity. That's what Ezekiel, I believe, was doing. He was reminding them, your hope is lost. Why is your hope lost? Look at all the wonderful promises that God has for us. And as we look, at, as we look in the past and we see, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to look at our own experience, amen? Have you lost hope in your spiritual life? Have you lost hope in your morning devotions? There's good news for you today, amen? God has wonderful thoughts towards you. Even the things that nobody else knows in the church about you, God knows them and He still loves you. I haven't figured that one out yet. I'm working on that. Ezekiel 37 is a message of hope, but it's also a message of self-assessment and self-examination. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to be honest with ourselves. If we find ourselves in spiritual deadness, we must embrace this truth. See, what happens many times is you take a typical congregation and it's spiritually dead. It's a valley of dry bones, right? But then we wonder, what can we do to revive this church? And we think, hmm, the Bible, you know, old stories. Let's take the young people, for example. I, I'm, I'm a young person, you know. What are we going to do to get the young people on fire? You ever wonder that? Maybe, maybe in your church there's, there's several young people there. What are we going to do? You think the Bible, they're going to be bored. To, ah, they're going to be bored to death. What do we need to do? And you start getting what? Creative. <laughs> to our own detriment, right? And we start to a certain extent creating an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit that actually isn't an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we can't be creative in the sense of, okay, you know, what are some ways that we could befriend the young people? What are some ways that we could build relationships? I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that many times if... We're getting creative to the point where we're excluding the Word of God, which at the end of the day is the, is the remedy for a lack of revival. We really need to check ourselves. 
Because what we're doing is we're just simply putting makeup on a valley of dry bones. And at the end of the day, guess what? There's still bones. <laughs> there is no life. I have never seen skeletons with makeup on. Amen? And I think many times in our approach, in our methodology to revival and to church growth, we tend to want to beautify a bunch of people that are skeletons. And that's, that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to present truth. There's a reason why Paul called it the foolishness of preaching. Yeah? It's a spiritual dynamic. It's a spiritual thing. And by the way, when you get a group of young people together, and there's a strong, wonderful uh, social dynamic there, because you have to, uh, we have to embrace the reality that we have to have a tight social dynamic there. But when you have the Word of God in the middle of a group of young people, watch out. Because something incredible is about to happen. Amen? And by the way, look at our pioneers, yeah? Our pioneers were young teenagers. What happened? They were surrounded with the right other kind of young people. You put the Word of God right in the middle, and there was an incredible revival that took place. So let us never, never belittle the power of the Word of God. Do we remember how... This world was created in the first place? How did God create the world? He said, all right, guys, take out the hammers, take out the caterpillars. Is that, what he, is that what he said? What did he say? He said, let there be light. Boom, there was light. Right? What else did he do? He spoke everything into existence, except, of course, when he came to the creation of man. He rolled up his sleeves, amen? He got his hands dirty. <laughs> but when you look at the, the majority of the creation account, God spoke words into he spoke something out of nothing yeah and when he speaks things happen when you look at your church you think to yourself oh my goodness there is no talent here right there is nothing here when you preach the word of god to a group of nothing something is going to come out of it because i read in genesis chapter one that the world was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep so if you go to church on Sabbath and you are in a place that is dark and void and empty and it's a mess, well then guess what? The Spirit of God can make that ugly place and turn it into a beautiful place. But what is the secret? The secret is how God created the, the world in the first place. He spoke it into existence. So when you preach, when you present the Word of God into places where is destitute of life, I haven't figured it out, but something happens. So don't ever underestimate the power of the Word, ladies and gentlemen. When you look in Luke chapter 24, run with me to Luke chapter 24. This is the Old Testament account, and I believe we have a parallel New Testament account of Ezekiel 37. Not exactly, but I think we, spiritually speaking, we can see some parallels. Luke chapter 24, of course, speaks of what? It's the last chapter in the Gospel of Luke. It's a famous story of the road to... Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, when you're there, please say amen. amen. Beginning in verse 13. The Bible says in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, Now behold, two of them, two of the disciples, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now what just, ha what just had happened? Jesus was assassinated, right? So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they could not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have not known the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus, duh, I added that done there by the way, Jesus, duh, of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So here you have Jesus who's kind of masquerading himself, yeah? And he kind of enters into the conversation as if he doesn't know what's going on. And they're explaining to him what just had happened. Jesus was crucified. He was assassinated. They're talking about all of the headlines, right? And if you notice carefully, what was their reaction to the headlines about Jesus of Nazareth, the promised Messiah who was just crucified? I heard it over here somewhere. Ah, we have a theologian in the front row. Right there in verse 21. 
We're told, and I have the New King James, uh, depending on the translation that you have, it words it a little different, but it says, but we were hoping that it was he, Jesus, who was going to redeem Israel. So if they were hoping that Jesus was going to redeem Israel, Jesus was just crucified, what are the implications? Their hope less. They had hope at one point, but because of the tragedy that had just taken place, they lost hope. Where do we read that also? Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 told us that the, the Israelites, when they lost hope, eventually they began the, the, the downward path into becoming a valley of dry bones. They lost hope. Luke 24, the two disciples, they lost hope. Ladies and gentlemen, when we lose hope in the message, when we lose hope that Jesus is coming again, we are destined to the valley of dry bones. And when you look at Luke chapter 24, we're told that this group of people lacked hope. And because they lacked hope, they also lacked spiritual life. So that means that they were in need of revival, the R word, yeah? Revival. So here you have Dr. Jesus, amen? Who's a spiritual doctor. And he's looking and he's listening to the symptoms, amen? He's listening to the spiritual symptoms of these two patients, <laughs> And he's thinking, hmm, what um, medication shall I use to bring revival to these precious patients that I have that have lost their hope in me and in the Word and in their salvation? Where shall I go? Hmm, beginning in verse 27. He goes to his cabinet, yes? <laughs> he opens his cabinet and he looks at all of the spiritual remedies. And what does he do? Verse 27. He pulls out the philosophy of men. No? What does it say? Ah, there it is. Verse 27. And beginning where? At Moses. What does that mean? First five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch. And all the prophets. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Question. What pill did Jesus, Dr. Jesus, prescribe to these two patients that were ill spiritually, that were in need of revival because they lost hope. He went to the Word of God, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Jesus in Luke chapter 24 is a figure of Ezekiel. Yes? Ezekiel was in chapter 37 of Ezekiel, and he was issuing what? The Word of God. That's why he was given to a group of people that were dead. Jesus in Luke chapter 24 is doing the very same thing to these two disciples, and he's taking them back to the Word of God, and to the Scriptures. And He's telling them that all of these things really are talking about me. Amen? Amen. Even the Chronicles talk about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Don't be fooled. <laughs> Some of us grow weary reading name after name after name after name. If you look carefully, you will find the face of Jesus in, that, in those passages. Amen. So here you have Jesus. He's talking to them. Yeah. And in verse 21, they were hoping that Jesus would redeem them. Verse 27, He says, well, this is the solution. You guys obviously have a problem. Well, look down in verse 28. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him saying, Abide with us. Please stay. It is almost nighttime. It is toward evening. And the day is far spent. And he, and he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he what? vanished out of their sight. Verse 32 is critical. If you believe in underlining, please, this is the text to underline. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us? And in order to burn, what must you have? you got to have fire, yeah? But where was it burning? Where was it firing? It was burning in their hearts. Amen? They were burning. It was burning within them. How? What was it that caused the burning? What was it that caused the fire? It says, while he talked with us on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want your heart to fire and burn with revival, you know what you need to do? Take a little walk with Jesus and hear his voice because that's exactly what these disciples experienced. He talked with us on the road. Take a walk down the road with Jesus. And while he opened the scriptures to us, there was fire in the hearts of these disciples. And notice, they didn't just sit on that fire. They were like, wow, this is so nice. 
we have fire burning inside of us. So let's just, yeah, let's just continue sitting and hanging out. You know, we're having a great time. Jesus just came by. We realize that uh, there is a lot of hope for Israel. So we're just going to hang out for the rest of the day. And in fact, we're going to just stay here for the rest of the week. And we're not really going to do much because we're having such an amazing time in here that uh, we're just going to hog this fire for ourselves. Is that what it says? No, No, ladies and gentlemen. In verse 33, they rose up when? That very hour. (laughs) And returned to Jerusalem. Now remember how far was Emmaus from Jerusalem? Seven miles from Jerusalem. They had, and they didn't have, you know, buses or, you know, Toyota Camrys back then, yeah? So they had to walk. I'm sure they were running and leaping. Amen? Amen. They were running and leaping back to Jerusalem. Why? What were they looking for? They were looking for the rest of the crew. They were looking for the rest of the team. They were looking for the rest of their brothers and sisters in church. The eleven and those that were with him gathered, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared unto Simon. They told about the things that had happened, verse 35, on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So here we have the divine remedy for revival. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus were walking. They were kind of dragging their feet, talking about all the gloomy, doomy stuff that had just taken place. Jesus interrupts that gloomy doominess. He brings some sunshine. He brings the Word of God. Not only does He bring the Word of God, but what else does He do? He didn't just preach to them. What else did He do? He went inside their home. Amen? Did He not do that? Why did He go inside their home? Well, because they invited Him, yes. But what were they doing inside their home? They were, they were eating. Eating is a wonderful thing, amen? Amen? Especially when you have some good food. And I'm blessed at my church because potlucks, oh, Lord have mercy. It's beautiful over there. So Jesus went inside the home and he was sharing a meal. And of course in the Hebrew culture and many other cultures, the Hispanic culture, the Filipino culture, many, many other cultures, it's common to, when you share a meal, it's kind of a sign of, of a connection, a friendship, a bond, yes? So what Jesus was doing here is he was sharing a meal with them. He went into their home. He spent time with them. He was developing and building relationships. And after that took place, after he prayed, after he blessed the food, why he disappeared, you know, that's a a good theological question that we don't have time to unpack. But while he prayed and when he spent time, then is when the fire was felt. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want revival to take our churches, it must begin in the home. Amen? Amen? Although, yes, we do need the Word of God and we do need to proclaim it and we do need to share it. True. But we need to remember two things. And we're going to develop this in in our part two of this presentation. That revival is spiritual power, point number one. How do we know spiritual power? Well, because we saw in Ezekiel chapter 37. We see here in Luke chapter 24 that both Ezekiel and Jesus are coming with the Word of God to bring spiritual life, spiritual power. But it's also not only spiritual power, but it's also social power. And we're going to go to the book of Acts eventually uh, in, in, in part two. And we're going to see how, what does a church that is revived look like? You want to see a, a, a perfect church? Yes. Well, then you have to stay tuned for part two. <laughs> okay, that's the commercial for part two. We're going to take a look. What does a perfect church look like, right? What is the ideal church that is revived actually look like? And the book of Acts gives us that picture. We have... Notice we, we didn't have to go to a local bookstore to pick up uh, some guy's new ideas. It's in the book of Acts. It's been written there for thousands of years. Now, I'm not saying that we can't, you know, think a little bit more creative and, 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 and you look at other different uh, things and approaches, how, how we could perfect our approaches. But at the end of the day, the Word of God is our manual. So we must go with the Word of God and actually do what it says. And the book of Acts gives us this beautiful picture. And I, and I have to warn you. When we get into part two of this presentation and we show you a picture of Acts chapter two, you may be tempted to change your membership into that church. Amen? Amen. But you can't do that because that church is not around. (laughs) Amen? But the idea is so that church could be that type, that model of that church could be duplicated in all of our churches. Amen? Amen. Revival is possible. You may be attending a church that is absolutely dead and you're wondering to yourself, how in the world can I... Uh, There's hope. Don't give up. Do not walk out on that church. 
because you may be that Ezekiel. And what you need to do is bring some sunshine into that church. Amen. Don't point your finger. Don't be negative. There's already enough negativity in the church. Amen? Amen. Go in there with some sunshine. Show, if you have it all figured out, show, show them how it's done. Amen? <laughs> Take the love of Jesus in there. Take the Word of God. Show them how being connected to the Word of God is so much more powerful and so much more awesome. Amen? Amen? And then you will have a bunch of people that will experience what the disciples, those two disciples in the road to Emmaus experience. They're going to be like, man, we feel this burning inside of us. We feel this, uh, this fire. And if you, let's take a look at that fire. Jeremiah, this is my last text for, for this presentation. Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. That fire. That fire. Jeremiah chapter 20. What is that fire? What does it look like? Jeremiah chapter 20. We're going we're gonna to take a look at the, the second half of that text. When you're there, please say amen. Jeremiah chapter 20. In verse 9, it says, But his word was in my heart like a burning fire. And when you have burning fire, notice what happens. It was shut up in my bones. Now, wait a second. We said that Ezekiel 37, it was a valley of dry bones. Now, all of these bones are on fire. That's revival. I was weary of holding it back. There was so much fire, I got tired of restraining myself talking about Jesus. Amen? <laughs> and I could not. When you have a group of believers that are together and they have the fire of the love of Jesus, the fire of the Word of God, they cannot help but share Jesus. Amen? I want to close in sharing an article with you that I saw that I thought was very, very interesting from the New York Times about a forest fire that took place. A forest fire that burned 800 acres a fire that forced the evacuation of 2,000 people. A fire that damaged 56 homes and caused about $84,000 in damage. Does anybody want to take a guess how that fire started? A careless flick of a cigarette. Something so apparently insignificant, something so apparently small, created this great, vast fire. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need a different kind of fire, but with that magnitude, that same magnitude in our churches. And maybe you're wondering, well, what can I do for Jesus? Well, remember, it was a tiny, apparently insignificant cigarette that did that. It was a tiny spark that created this kind of revolution, this chain reaction of flames and fire and burning. And maybe, just maybe, you are that match that God needs in order for that church to catch on fire. Don't underestimate the potential that you have. Don't underestimate what God can do with you and through you. Don't let your failures and your humanity get in the way of what God can do through you. Amen? Amen. We all have challenges. We all have our, have our issues. But maybe ask the Lord, Lord, what can I do for my local congregation? Because many a time we find ourselves going to church trying to receive revival and it not being found there. And maybe God is asking us, well, wait a second. Maybe we need to bring a little bit of the revival in our experience. Inside the congregation, permeate the atmosphere with that attractive, beautiful portrait of Jesus. And maybe then and only then will others catch on that vision. And will others recognize that they've been missing out on this awesome experience. And then and only then will not only your church be on fire, amen, but your whole community will be on fire. And like the atheist who started running towards the church because finally he saw something exciting going on in the church. He's like, wow, the, the church is on fire. This is the first time I've ever seen it on fire. Maybe you'll find a lot of people running to your church. Maybe you'll find a lot of old former members that have left. And the Lord is going to shock you. Wow, what are you, what are you doing here? How long has it been? Yeah? Maybe, maybe your children. I know there's a lot of parents here. I know there's a lot of grandparents here that have been praying for their, for their children and their grandchildren. And by the way, I'm a product of a grandmother's prayer, by the way. If my grandmother didn't pray for me, somebody else would be speaking to you this morning. So don't lose hope in what God can do for you. Don't lose hope in those around who've maybe slipped and fell because of the circumstances and situations in life. And recognize that even your church, your little church, if it's little, something great can come out of that. Now, don't expect everybody to catch the vision overnight. Amen? Amen. Some of these things take time. 
Not only does it take time, but sometimes you have to do it one-on-one. -on -one. Don't expect to preach a sermon and then everybody's on fire. It doesn't, doesn't always happen like that. Amen? Jesus went into the home. He spoke. He smiled. He shook hands. He encouraged. He gave hope. He loved. He shared. He shared more. He explained. And then there was fire that took place in the hearts of those people. You know what you can do for your church? Very simple. You can pray for the leadership of that church. Amen? Amen. You can pray for the elders in that church. You can pray for the pastor in that church. Let's not be negative towards the authority or the leadership in the church. Amen? Let's respect it. Let's pray for them. And another thing that you can do as a lay person is you can join the elders in visiting some of the sheep. Amen? Because when you visit some of the members, you'll realize, wow, even in our own ranks, there are people like those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. There are people in the same condition that are down and out, that are hopeless, and they come and they congregate every Sabbath morning in our church. And we think everybody's fine because unfortunately we have a very shallow and superficial experience with one another. But Jesus wants to create a revival and revolution of love and of mercy. Amen.